Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome indeed to our service this morning, especially to those of you who are visiting with us. We trust that you'll enjoy your time with us uh, as we worship together. Uh, tomorrow is the Synodical Day of Prayer, and that's been held at Dermara. It uh, starts at 10.30, and it'll, uh, I'm not just quite sure how long it goes on for, but that's in, in Dermara. The midweek on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m., as usual, of course, in the Minor Hall, and this week we will focus on the mission in the uh, Covenant and Church in Ireland uh, instead of the usual study. Then on a Friday evening, uh, again, 8 p.m., the Badminton um, group will meet then. Drumbold uh, Women's Fellowship, the subscriptions for this year should be given to the treasurer, Mrs. Ivy Port, and that should be uh, done by Sabbath the 4th of December. As well as that, any changes to orders for Bible reading notes for 2023, please speak to Martha as uh, soon as possible. Or again, if, you've, if you want to start ordering, uh, I'm sure Martha will be delighted to help you out there. Um, Covenant or Witness subscription is now due, and you should give your remittance to Jean uh, Miller. Cost is £20 for the year. And again, if there's any family that's not currently subscribed and you would like to, well, just let Jean know and she'll um, put you on the list there. Finally, there's still two or three copies of the Minutes of Synod there in the vestibule table for anyone that uh, have a look at it. And the cost is £7 for that. Um, so that's the announcements for this week. So with that, I'll hand over to John for today's service. Well, good morning. Let's come and worship God. And our invitation to worship him this morning comes from Zechariah chapter uh, 1. Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 3, where uh, God says to his people through Zechariah the prophet, So say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Public worship. Uh, as we gather, we come to praise God, don't we? We come to glorify him for the great God that he is. But it's also a time where we return to God again. We come and we repent of the ways that we failed him as his servants in this past week. And we receive his strength to live in this next week. And so it's a wonderful truth as we realize that we are Christians that feel him, that he still invites us to return to him once again. Well, let's come and sing praise from Psalm 105. Psalm 105. We're going to be singing stanzas one and two, and then we'll be jumping over into the section about Joseph in verses 15 through to 19. Psalm 105, we're going to be singing stanzas 1 and 2, and then stanzas 15 to 19. So you can put your finger in there, so you can do a quick flick over. Uh, so here the psalmist is beginning, remember this is a historical psalm, and he's thanking the Lord, and he begins by thanking the Lord for all the wondrous deeds God's done and so the rest of the psalm is given over to him recounting and remembering the different ways that God has helped his people. And as we have been looking at in these last weeks, we are looking at the life of Joseph. 
And so we see Joseph in stanza 15 being released from prison after he's interpreted the king's dreams. And how he's then invested with all that power in stanza 16. And how he then rules over the land in stanza 17. And how his family come down in verse stanzas 18 and 19 to dwell in Egypt with him. And this was all part of God's plan, remember. It was all about God advancing his purposes. And so we recount the wondrous deeds that God has done for his people in past days. And as we do that, we remember how he has been our help and the wondrous deeds he's done in our own lives. So we stand and we sing together stanzas one and two and 15 to 19. The tune is 139. Let's praise God. O Lord God, we do call upon your name, and we call upon it in the name of Christ Jesus. For Lord, we know that we of ourselves cannot approach you because you are the holy God. You are the awesome God. You are the Lord of hosts who has all power and authority. You're the one who makes known your wondrous deeds across the world. You're the one who um, outworks your, your will according to your own desire. Lord, it's you we come to glorify this morning. It's you we lift our voices to in praise. Lord, it's you that we direct our attention to as we come to listen to your word and to hear it preached. 
Lord, it is you that we offer our prayers unto. And Lord, we praise you. We give you thanks that you delight in this, that you uh, find pleasure in this, and that it pleases you, Lord, to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we want to give you thanks for all your wondrous deeds done throughout the generations. Of how, Lord, here in the life of Joseph, you were advancing your purposes of salvation. That as you brought Israel and his family down to Egypt, you were preserving your people, not only for that generation, but preserving your people so that the Christ who was to come would come indeed, because he would come from Judah. And Lord, we praise you for how his coming has meant the preserving and the saving of our lives too. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for your wondrous deeds in the past. But, Lord, we also want to come and we give you thanks for your wondrous deeds here presently that we have known in our own lives. Lord, we thank you for how you have delivered each one of us from our sins as we have faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for how you've made us aware of our sins and how you've turned our cold, hard hearts into hearts of flesh, into living beings Lord, as your spirit has filled us and brought that new life. And we thank you, Lord, that you are still in the business of saving people and that any who call upon you will be saved from their sins. Lord God, we want to thank you for, your help, for the help and the strength you've given us in this past week in all the work that we have done. But Lord, as we reflect on this past week, we are reminded of the many times that we have fallen short. Yes, Lord, we, your people, are still susceptible, capable, and we do sin against you. And Lord, our sins grieve you. And so, Lord, we thank you that you're a God who invites us to return to you and that you will return to us, that you are ready to forgive us, that you're waiting upon us. And so, Lord, we come and we confess our sins again, all in the name of Jesus. Lord, we confess Lord, where we've used these harms, hands to cause harm rather than to do good. Lord, we confess where our feet have taken us in the past week where we shouldn't have gone. Lord, we confess where our mind has gone where it shouldn't have. Where the thoughts that have entered our mind have been ungodly and have not glorified your name. Lord, we confess where our tongues have been used destructively and Lord, not for good. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Please have mercy upon us. In the name of Christ our Savior, we ask all these things. And Lord, we pray it in confidence, knowing that as we pray in the name of Christ, we will be forgiven. Amen. Well, turn with me in God's word to Genesis chapter 46, please. Genesis chapter 46. It's found on page 52 in the Pew Bible. Genesis chapter 46. We left off halfway through this chapter last week. Just we're breaking up quite a long uh, period of narrative, uh, which is, and so we've, we've divided it. Remember last week we saw God's will being shown to Jacob as he uh, sought it and then trusted in it and obeyed as he went down to Egypt with his whole family. And we saw, and we, we now pick up in verse 28 where they finally arrive in Egypt. And during this section, uh, we really, our mind is drawn back to the dire need of, of the people of Canaan, of uh, Egypt uh, during the famine and how Joseph serves them as a leader. And so we pick up Genesis 46, beginning at verse 28. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and he went up to Go- went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And as soon as Joseph appeared before him, 
he threw his arms around his father and wept a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I'm ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh, and I will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me, and they are shepherds. They tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks you, What is your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Joseph went to Pharaoh, and my fathers and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and everything they own, have come from the land of Canaan and are now in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and he presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked his brother, the brothers, what is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, we have come to live here for a while because the famine is severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now, please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best of the land, the district of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. There was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payments for the grain they were buying, and he bought, brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone. All Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is all gone. Then bring your livestock, said Joseph. I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep, goats, their cattle and, la and donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, we cannot hide our, from our Lord the fact that our money, that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes, we and our land as well? Buy us and our land in exchange for food, and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought 
all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one in all and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from their allotment. Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, Now that I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you, so you can plant the ground. But when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for the fields and for, as food for yourselves and your households and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as a law concerning the land in Egypt, still in force today, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. Now the Egyptians settled in, uh, sorry, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come to the front? Boys and girls, I wonder who do we call when we are in need? James. Jesus. Yes, we can call Jesus. Let's say you fall outside. Who would you call? James. Policeman. The policeman. You might call the policeman. Yes, we can call the policeman at different times. You might call the police when, when, someone's, when there's a robbery in progress. Or maybe if there's an accident on the road. But you probably call your mum or dad. You know, if you bump your knee, you're like, Mom! And Mom has to come running out and she gets it all cleaned up and bandaged up. And Mom's your hero that day, isn't she? Well, what happens if there's a fire? Who would we call if there's a fire? Ella. The fire brigade. And they would come in the fire truck and they would hopefully be able to put the fire out. And then if someone's sick, where might we, who might we have to call? Where would we take them? Rachel. You would take them to the hospital and hopefully they would get seen by a doctor. Isn't that right? And they would be able to help them in their time of need. Well, boys and girls, there's a big problem still in Egypt. There's still a famine going on. And a famine is where they're not able to grow any new food. Remember, Joseph had stored up lots of food in the sheds to store for the years of famine. And, but the people then run out of money. And so Joseph gives them, tells them how they can then buy a new food. And so the people keep coming to Joseph to save them because without food, what's going to happen? You're going to get, yes, James? You're, you're going to die, yeah, yeah. You're going to get a really hungry tummy and then you're finally, you're right, going to die. But you know what the people say after Joseph gives them food? We read this in our, in our chapter there, in verse 25. And the people said, you, that's Joseph. Joseph, you have saved our lives. You have saved our lives. Now, James, you, you obviously knew where I was going in my children's address. You said, Jesus is one that can help us. What has Jesus come to help us with? What's our biggest problem that we have in our lives? We're beginning with S. Sin. 
sin. Yes, that's right. We have sin, and that's, that's a big problem in our lives. Egypt had no food, but that wasn't as big a problem as us on our sin in our lives. But Jesus has come to save us from that crisis, from that big problem. And so, boys and girls, we need to ask him to save us from our sins. We need to say to him, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. Please, would you forgive me? And boys and girls, maybe some of you are already Christians and you already believe in Jesus. Well, what you can do is you can pray to Jesus and you can say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me from my sin. And so, boys and girls, the biggest problem we have in our lives is the problem of sin. But Jesus has come to rescue us from it. Here's your sheet for today. And you can then go back to your seats. All right, Rachel. Let's continue to worship God as we present to him our tithe. We're going to pray in a moment, and we want to pray for our nation again. We're going to be seeing this morning of how Egypt was a nation living through a crisis. Their crisis was famine, and our own nation is going through various crises at the, crises, crises at the moment, and so we want to pray uh, for that. We also want to give thanks to God. Uh, Paul Flynn has accepted the call to Rough Island Congregation And so we want to give thanks to God for his revealing of his will to Paul. And we want to pray for him and for Reverend Blair as they make their moves, as he, Reverend Blair, moves to Dervik and then Mr. Flynn to Rath Ryland in the weeks to come. And so let's stand as we pray. Lord God, we praise you that we can take the words of the Egyptians on our own lips, that which they said of Joseph, we can say of you, you have saved our lives. We can say it of you, Christ Jesus, you the sacrifice who took our place at death, took our place at judgment, you have saved our lives. And we can say it of you, Holy Spirit, because you are the one who has worked that grace into our lives, awakening our dead hearts. You have saved our lives. And Lord, as we think of that salvation that you have uh, given to us, Lord, we think of our families, we think of our neighbours, we think of our work colleagues, we think of those, Lord, who were (coughs) once connected or maybe still are connected perhaps even here this morning, Lord, that do not yet know you, who yet, as of yet, cannot say of the greater Joseph, you have saved our lives. Lord, we pray that you would save them. Lord, we pray that you would deliver them from a death greater than starvation. Lord, we pray that they would come to you and say, why should we die before your eyes? 
both we and our people. Lord, would they then know that life-giving work by the Spirit as he uh, applies the work of Christ to them. Would they, Lord, know the forgiveness and the freedom from all their sin, from its guilt, Lord? And would we be able to praise you for you bringing them into the kingdom? Lord God, we want to also remember our nation at this time. She, like Egypt, is going through a crisis. And Lord, it seems to be that it's just crisis after crisis that comes upon our land with the instability of government, with the changing of political leaders, Lord, with the political fallout that happens. We think of the economic crisis. We think of the pandemic, the fuel crisis, Lord. We think of the crises that sweep across our world as well at this time of famine and uh, war. Lord, we pray that you would raise up in our land men like Joseph, women like Joseph, who, are, who have the qualities of wisdom and compassion, who have that hev- heavenly wisdom and have that godly compassion, that they would be able to direct our nation to, through these crises, that they, Lord, would be found, that these godly leaders would be found in the quarters of power, even, Lord, commanding from the very top, Lord. We think of our sovereign. Lord, we think also of number 10. Lord, we pray that in these uh, buildings that there would be those who are believers and that, Lord, would give wise uh, wise guidance uh, to, Lord, those who do lead us. Lord, we pray that once again within, Lord, Parliament and Stormont, there would be those who would have the Spirit of God and that they would lead from the front and that, Lord, our nation would be saved, Lord, from the crises that surround it. Lord, we do give you thanks this morning for uh, the answered prayers on behalf of congregations that have been vacant. We thank you, Lord, for how you called uh, Reverend Blair to uh, leave Limavani and go to Dervik, and also Mr. Flynn to take up the pastoral ministry for the first time as he goes to Rough Ryland. Lord, we pray that you'd be with these men. We pray that you'd confirm to them and to their families amidst the pressures, the stress and the worries that, Lord, this is indeed your will. And, Lord, would they know you providing for them in the midst of, Lord, this situation as they pack, as they move houses, as they set up home and establish their families in in new communities. Lord, we pray that you would uh, provide, Lord, for their every need in accordance with your will. Lord, as we come now to turn our attention to your word, we pray that you would grant us concentration. We pray that you would block out those things that would distract us, Lord, from uh, uh, concentrating on your word. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would grant us understanding and that we, Lord, would be able to live in response to it. We ask all these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Crisis is a word that we've become very familiar with. Last year, there was the Ukraine crisis when Russia massed thousands of military personnel and equipment on the Ukrainian border. Later, in September 2021, there was the fuel crisis when filling stations ran out of fuel because of panic buying, because there was a fear that there was going to be a shortage of fuel. 2022 began the global food crisis, a consequence of the pandemic, which was then exasperated by the invasion of Ukraine. Most recently, Britain and Northern Ireland and other countries across the globe have been faced with the cost of living crisis. It seems that our nation and much of the world We go from crisis to crisis. And what is it that we're supposed to think as Christians? How are we to react to such circumstances in our lives? Are we to panic like the world? 
in our passage today. Egypt, Canaan, and the nations of the Mediterranean continue to face a crisis. The famine has been in the region for at least two years now. It began in Egypt, remember, and it spread and it affected the neighboring nations until it swept across that whole region. Genesis 47, 13 tells us there was no food in all the land. It's not referring here to the granaries where the the food's been stored, but there's no production of any new food. There's still no one a barrenness of the ground. Three times the author reminds us of the severity of the famine in chapter 47. Verse 4, verse 13, and verse 20, it says it was too severe. Egypt and Canaan are described as languishing or wasting away. It's the word used of someone fainting. The country has collapsed. It's lying there in a peep. The land is pale and it is barren. Remember the famine began in Genesis 42. But it's, and it's really been the backdrop to the main event since then of Joseph being reunited with his family. But now in Genesis 47, our attention is drawn back to the famine. And again, we see the distress, the deprivation, and the devastation the famine causes. It appears that with each year, its effects get progressively worse. The nation of Egypt is living through a crisis. And here we find God's people are at the center of it. They move from Canaan and they live in in Egypt, which is at the center of this crisis of a famine. And we want to observe today how the church, how God's people, because remember, that is what Israel is. Israel's family, Jacob's family, are the people of God at this stage. They are the church. How do they live through a nation going through crisis? We want to think, firstly, about how God's people, boys and girls, are kept in crisis. How God's people are kept in crisis. And here we pick up from where we left off last week in verse 28. It would be helpful for you to have your Bible open uh, there so we can make reference to the chapter. Verse 28 of chapter 46 and here, Joseph is being, having this emotional reunion with his father, Jacob. Joseph wants his family to dwell in Goshen, which is a province or a district in Egypt, a bit like the counties that we have across Northern Ireland. Don't forget that Pharaoh has already invited Joseph's family to come down and dwell in Egypt back in Genesis 45. But as of yet, Pharaoh hasn't made clear, or at least the scriptures haven't made clear specifically where Pharaoh wants them to live. And so what we find here in these verses 28 through to chapter 47 verse 12 is Joseph using his political knowledge, his wisdom and his diplomacy to ensure that it's Goshen that Israel dwell in. In verses 31 to 34, Joseph prepares his brothers for their audience with Pharaoh. Just like someone going to meet royalty will be given a few pointers by the advance party. Before they greet King Charles or meet Prince William, they'll be told what they can and they can't do, what they should say and what they shouldn't, how they should curtsy or bow and how they shouldn't touch royalty unless They're invited to with a handshake. And so Joseph, he's coaching his brothers here. He's telling them, well, I'm going to go and see Pharaoh here. And this is what I'm going to say. And then Pharaoh's going to call you in. And he's going to ask you about your vocation. He's going to focus on your job. And this is what you must say, brothers. The key point to both Joseph's speech with Pharaoh... And the brother's answers to Pharaoh 
is that they must say that they are shepherds. And verse 34 of chapter 46 tells us why. It explains why it is paramount that they say that they are shepherds. In order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Historians aren't sure why shepherds were an abomination to Egyptians. Joseph, but that doesn't matter. Joseph knows it, and he he knows that the mention of their vocation will ensure that they are kept separate from the populace of Egypt. And that place is Goshen. It will secure his family dwelling in Goshen. You maybe remember back when Joseph invites the brothers to dinner and he's sitting there and how uh, Moses makes clear that Joseph sits by himself, the brothers sit as a group, and then the Egyptians sit as a group. They won't even sit at the same dinner table together. And so there's this separation between those who are Egyptian and those who are actually um, non-natives and uh, our shepherds. You're probably asking, why did Joseph want them to live separately? Why was Joseph's mind set on Goshen? Why did it have to be Goshen? Well, I think there's two reasons. In Goshen, Israel's physical needs would be met. It seems to have been sparsely populated, having plenty of space for a hundred people to go and with their belongings and set up home. Pharaoh describes Goshen in verse 6 as being the best of the land. So it was resourceful enough for them to have grazing. Remember Joseph's brothers say that they've come to Egypt in verse 4 because there's no pasture for them in Canaan. And so they need uh, food for their flocks. And so Goshen is a resourceful place. And there Joseph would be able to provide for his family with food, verse 12. And so in Goshen, their physical needs would be met. Moreover, their spiritual needs are met in Goshen. In Goshen, Israel would be separate from the main population of Egypt. They'd be isolated. You could say they would be quarantined, so to speak. And so they'd be kept from the Egyptian culture, from the morality and the idolatry found in Egypt. Goshen was its own entity. It's a bit like Vatican City. It's surrounded there by, uh, uh, by the, the other countries, and yet it is itself, it's self-governing, it's self-sustaining in, in, in one sense as well. That's what Goshen was for Israel. Therefore, living in Goshen would mean that there was less risk of Israel being amalgamated and assimilated with the Egyptians. Goshen would preserve Israel's identity as the people of God. Joseph's plan succeeds in Genesis 47, verse 6. Pharaoh grants them the land of Goshen. And Goshen is the ideal spot. In Goshen, Israel's physical needs are met. She was preserved from death by starvation. In Goshen, Israel's spiritual needs are met. Her purity as God's people would be preserved. Different foods in our homes come with instructions on how to maintain their freshness. Your milk is to be stored in the fridge and once opened, consumed within three days. Your cereal should be stored in a cool and dry place with the bag folded down. And biscuits, once opened, are to be stored in an airtight container. These actions preserve the food and maintain their freshness. Otherwise, your milk will curdle, your cereal will be chewy, and your biscuits soft. And no one enjoys a soft biscuit. 
In Genesis 47, we see God preserve his people in crisis. It was critical that Israel be preserved. Think about how much of the rest of our Bibles are built on Israel, are built on the nation. Exodus, the conquest, the kings, the exile. Think too about that ancient promise made to Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. The promised Savior would come through Israel, through the tribe of Judah, from the line of David. And so God preserving his people here meant that he was preserving the seed line to Jesus. Means that he was preserving salvation. Believer, we could say, back then, God was preserving your life and mine. Because of without Israel being preserved physically and spiritually, none of the rest of Scripture would have happened. Our Savior wouldn't have come and we would be lost in our sins. Without Christ's death, we would have no hope of forgiveness. And so God here is preserving his people. He's preserving salvation. And that's what God continues to do for his church today. Whether it be a global crisis like a pandemic, we've seen and we've witnessed how his church is preserved. Or a national crisis such as persecution in Afghanistan, or war like in Ukraine, or economic collapse like in Britain. God's church is preserved. Right down to the local crisis in your own life. Even in the local church, God preserves his people. And isn't that what Jesus said when he lived here on this earth? The gates of hell will not prevail. Christian, be encouraged. God's church stands unmoved. God's people are preserved through crisis. God's people are preserved in crisis. Let's think now, boys and girls, here's your word. Your second word is help. God's people help in crisis. God's people help in crisis. And we're now focusing here on verses 13 through to 26, which records Joseph dealing with the Egyptians through the final years of famine. And we want to note two godly qualities that Joseph displays as he assists. He's one of God's people. He's the helper here, and he helps a nation in crisis. The first quality that we see in Joseph here is he's a man of compassion. And we've thought about this before. Remember, we saw it back when he was in the prison cell. And nothing has changed when he receives power and authority. He cares for those whom he rules over. The Egyptians are struggling. They're suffering in this crisis. Twice we read about how they fear that they would die in verse 15 and 19. Their problem was that they didn't have any money anymore to purchase grain. But Joseph doesn't just toss them out and say, well, if you don't have money, you can't buy grain. Tough. No. Instead, he provides an alternative means for them to purchase grain. He sees their need. His heart goes out to them and he won't leave them starving. And so he says, come, trade in your livestock, your land, Work for Pharaoh and you'll receive grain as payment. Joseph's assistance was full of compassion here. But the second quality which marks Joseph's assistance was his wisdom. The people have no money to buy grain, but he doesn't give them a handout. Certainly, it would have saved their lives, but ultimately, it would have done, done them and the nation great harm. It would have crippled the economy. It would have created an entitlement of culture among the peasants. 
Think about how Joseph's wisdom is shown and how he purchases the herd. He purchases their herd, their land. And then the commoner would have lost his work. He would have went out each day and fed his calves. Perhaps milked his cows. But once they had traded in their livestock, they didn't have the same work to do. Even more so when they sold their land to Pharaoh. It's not theirs anymore and they can't go and till it. But Joseph's careful here to not create an idle culture. A culture which is lazy and slothful. Verse 18 seems to suggest that the people continue to look after their livestock, though it be Pharaoh's. Joseph ensures that they have work to do. And we see that even more in verse 23, where they are the ones that are given and told to go and sow seed in the land. Finally, Joseph's wisdom is displayed as he endeavors that the people would no longer be reliant on the state after the famine ceased. He recognizes that there is a role for the state to play when there is a crisis. But he doesn't want the nation of Egypt to become dependent upon the state. He wants to restore to them their autonomy. And so in verse 23, Joseph gives them grain not only to eat, but also to sow. He lives out that proverb that you may know, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you will feed him for a lifetime. And so Joseph provides the grain that was needed to be seed in the ground for the first year after the famine, so that then they would be able to take a harvest the next year, have food for themselves, have seed to sow, and also there was a tax that they had to pay back to Pharaoh. In the BB. The highest award is the Queen's Badge. And one element that you have to complete is voluntary service. The boys have to assist other people, whether that be in a charity, a youth work, or sports organization. They have to learn to assist others and to serve them and to help them. As our nation faces crisis, crisis after crisis, we have sensed man's limitation to lead. We were even praying about it this morning in our prayer meeting. Our governors often have lacked having these two qualities. Our nation once again needs those in whom is the Spirit of God. We need politicians who have heaven's wisdom and God's compassion. Our nation needs godly leaders to lead us through the crises. I'm not necessarily saying that we need a Christian nation, though how wonderful that would be, wouldn't it? Remember Joseph's context. He was a believer, serving in a wicked, immoral, and pagan nation. He was the head ruler just under Pharaoh who served and directed all the affairs of the nation. And he was a believer serving in a wicked nation. And we've seen the results of his wise and his compassionate leadership. Our nation needs more than ever godly leaders. Godly leaders that are filled with compassion and wisdom. And so let's pray for this. But not only does our government need godly leaders, our households, places of work, and church needs it. Fathers, particularly, as heads of our home, are we pursuing godliness? Are we seeking its growth in our life that we may be able to rule our houses well as we've promised to in the vows that we've taken at our children's baptisms? Christian, you bring a dimension to the workplace. Young people, you bring a dimension to your school and to the classroom that your non-Christian colleagues and classmates cannot. As believers, you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the fruits of wisdom and compassion in your life. 
can I encourage you to seek their maturation so that you'd be of greater assistance in the workplace, that you'd be of better help to your classmates in school. Fellow elders, our pastoring is to be marked with wisdom and compassion. The challenge to us is, are we cultivating those two qualities in our care of the flock? Members, can we ask you to pray for us that we be able to care for you in that way? Would you pray for us that we would have wisdom as we come into your homes, as we stand on your doorsteps and talk to you, that we be able to show the compassion of our Savior as we shepherd you? God's people assist in crisis. We want to finally see this morning God's people grow in crisis, boys and girls. Grow is your word. Grow. What would you suggest are the optimal conditions for the church's growth? Would you choose oppression or peace? Exile or freedom? Suffering or happiness? Naturally, we would all expect it to be peace and freedom in our state and national success to be the optimal conditions to allow the church to flourish and grow. But verse 27 corrects our wrong conclusion. The author in verse, uh, uh, in verse 27 draws a contrast between Israel and Egypt. Read it with me. Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and they were filled, for, or sorry, and they were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Don't forget what's just been said about the Egyptians. By the end of the famine, they have no money. They've sold their livestock, the land, and themselves to Pharaoh. Whereas Israel has remained free, settled in their own land, and gaining possessions and multiplying in number. And this is miraculous because they've both lived under the same circumstances. They've lived in this famine. Israel has lived through the same crisis, crisis as the nation, as the native. And yet the outcome is drastically different. Moses tells us in verse 27, they increased greatly in number. And the idea there is of exponential growth. If you were to draw it on a graph, the line would have this sudden and sharp incline as the population which is recorded along the bottom just goes up and up and up now we don't know their numbers after the famine but Moses language here indicates that it was forceful that it was powerful it was extraordinary in 400 years time they'd be of a population of 2 million from 100 to two million. And so this was exponential growth, but it began in the years of famine. One commentator describes Canaan, where they've just come from, as the ideal circumstances because it was sparsely populated. There was a freedom there, and Israel had an abundance of resources apart from the time in famine. Yet, after Abraham and his family living there for 215 years, Israel had only grown from zero to 100. Whereas in the non-ideal conditions of crisis in Egypt, God's people prospered. We speak about the optimal conditions, don't we? For fuel economy, the RAC says it's between 45 and 50 miles per hour. Your fridge, to be most efficient, needs to be set at 2.78 degrees, supposedly. To get that perfectly runny egg, you've got to immerse the egg in boiling water for 30 seconds. And then you have to drop the temperature to a light simmer immediately 
to about 82 degrees to finish it off, so I'm told. The conditions in which Israel prospered were dire. And when we think about that, isn't that the conditions in which the church often grows today? Think of the church in East Asia. It's oppressed, it's persecuted, it's underground. And yet those are the conditions God chooses to let his church be millions strong in one single country. Whereas the West, with its supposedly ideal conditions of peace, freedom, and national prosperity, the church sees little growth, becomes stagnant, even deteriorates. Christian, I find myself wondering this week, are we praying for the wrong things when we pray for the end of persecution? I wonder, are we wrong to panic about the increased opposition to the Western church? Perhaps we shouldn't be so hesitant about it and rather expect God to do great things in it. Maybe even ask for the very opposite to what we usually do. Seeing how, much, how I, the church often thrives during hardship. There's been a lot happening in our nation, hasn't there? Crisis after crisis. Instability in government persists. Economic chaos ensues with inflation nearly rising every other week, if not definitely monthly. Maybe we should be praying that these crises, crises, crises won't go away, but instead should be praying that God would use them as a wake-up call to bring people to him in our land. At a personal level, when you go through that crisis in your work, in your health, a family matter, family member, what is our response? Do we try and wish it away or even pray it away? Perhaps in, what, in light of what we've seen here this morning, we should pray for strength, resolve and determination to weather it instead. We should stop and seek and uh, seek to see God's blessing being poured out even during crisis because that's what was happening to Israel. Israel was being blessed as she lived through that time of crisis. Maybe we should seek to see the blessing in our times of crisis. Unbeliever, I realize that the sermon today has been centered around the believer and that's because this chapter is written from that perspective. It records how God's people survive in crisis. What can you look to during the crisis? The national, the local, the personal. Are you like Egypt? Do you trust in your money and your possessions to save you? What happens when they're gone like Egypt's? What happens when there's no money left? What happens when they're no use to save you from your crisis? Can I draw your attention back, unbeliever, to what the Egyptians confessed in verse 25? They confessed to Joseph, you have saved us. They knew that they had the need to look to another to be saved. And that's the same with you, unbeliever. You need to look to Christ to be delivered from the greatest crisis of your sin, lest you perish and die. Come to him. Confess your sin. And he will, he will deliver you from your greatest crisis. Amen. We want to sing in closing from Psalm 67. Psalm 67. And we're singing the C version to, together. Psalm 67, C. We're singing the whole of the psalm and we're singing it to tune 219. We sang at the start and I, I, I forgot to point this out 
about how uh, Israel, we sang of them causing to be more fruitful and stronger there, even amidst the adversaries. And we pick up on that theme again in this psalm. As God blesses his people, stanza six, God, our own God, will bless us. Yea, God will blessing send, and all the earth shall fear him to its remotest end. Believer, as you go through that crisis in your life, as we live through the crises of our nation, God will bless us. He will preserve us through it. He will use us as assistance in it. And he is the one who causes us to grow, to prosper through it. Let's stand together and sing Psalm 67C. We sing the whole of the psalm. Let's praise God. Lord God, we do thank you for these wonderful words that we've been able to close by singing. Lord, of your mercy, of your grace, of your favor shining upon us. Lord, of how you do keep your people, even in the crisis that they face, even in the crises of life, the multiple of them, Lord, that they go through. Oh, we God, we thank you that in the midst of them, they are the helpers for the nation, that they are to be of assistance. Lord, we praise you that they are also those who will grow. And Lord, as you pour out your blessing upon them. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to have that right perspective. Help us to understand, Lord, how we are indeed to pray as we face uh, the crises of life. And now, people of God, lift up your heads and receive his blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the 